Flying is bad for the environment, and for someone who loves both airplanes and the environment, that sucks. Because on the one hand, the aviation industry contributed around 2.5% of all global CO2 emissions last year. But on the other hand, planes are f***ing cool. And some of you might say, well, 2.5% doesn't sound too bad. Well, if the aviation sector were a country, it would be among the top 10 countries by CO2 emissions. And just to put it in perspective, a round-trip flight between Montreal and London emits just as much carbon as heating a European home for an entire year. And on top of that, this number has been increasing at a concerning rate. Because while new planes have gotten more efficient by around 1-2% to every year, the demand for air travel has increased by about 5%. Well, without, you know. And at this rate, by 2050, a quarter of the world's CO2 emissions could come from airplanes alone. But what if we could stop all of that? With the rise of electric vehicles to reduce the carbon emission of cars, a reasonable next question would be, well, could we do the same with planes? And what would that even look like? Should we start building superchargers at the top of tall buildings? Well, in this video, I'll be answering your burning questions by taking a look at the physics and design of electric planes, so stay tuned. Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. If you want an interactive way to brush up on your math and science skills like I did for this video, but without a mountain of textbooks involved, then check out the link in the description below. The very first example of using electricity for air propulsion actually appeared in 1883, about 20 years before even the first flight of the Wright brothers, and this was on a modified airship. One of these initial electric airships, called La France, actually flew for 8 kilometers for a speedy 23 minutes, placing her just a hair slower than the 5k running world record for women. And of course, since then, we've explored a lot more creative solutions for more advanced electric aircraft. Some examples include power cables connecting the aircraft to a ground power supply over very low altitudes and short distances. And even microwave-powered planes by using power beaming technology from the ground, essentially nuking the sky using the same principles as wireless charging. But while these ideas are super interesting and seem like they're straight out of a Bond movie, they're not really well-researched enough or practical enough for us to really discuss today. And so in this video, we're going to do a deep dive on the two main contenders of providing energy on electric aircraft, and those are solar panels and batteries. Now the inner workings of a solar panel can be a long video in and of itself, but here's a one minute summary. Solar panels consist of thousands of photovoltaic cells that transfer light from the sun into electricity. How does it do this? Well, each photovoltaic cell consists of two layers, a slightly positive layer and a slightly negative layer. And it's not because one has an attitude problem, it's simple chemistry. One layer simply has extra electrons, making it slightly negative, while the other layer has extra holes where it wants to accept electrons, making it slightly positive. Now as light particles from the sun or photons hit the negative layer, it can sometimes knock an electron electron loose from its bond. And of course, this one free electron wants to travel to the positive layer. But there's one problem. There is an electric field between the two layers that prevent the electrons from simply moving over. But if we connect a wire between two layers, there's now a path of much less resistance for the electrons to move to the other side. And this movement of electrons is electricity. While creating electricity from the sun sounds great in theory, in practice, it's actually not as efficient as you think. For one, only a fraction of wavelengths of light can actually be absorbed, while the rest are reflected or passed through the layers. And these panels also need constant exposure to sunlight, which can be a little difficult in Canadian winters, or the UK, in in general. For these reasons, the average solar panel only has an efficiency around 20%. Okay, that was much longer than a minute, but hopefully you have a better context of how solar energy works and what are its limitations. So how does it apply to airplanes? Is it actually feasible? Well, short answer is yes, but is it practical? Not really. For one, the plane needs to be incredibly light in order to minimize the amount of power required to fly it. But you also want the largest possible surface area to place as many solar panels as you can to generate more power. So what you end up with is basically a flying ruler. And a plane with an enormous wingspan and very light and delicate panels means that it's very prone to turbulence and crosswinds. In fact, most models today can't even take off at wind speeds above 10 miles per hour, or just slightly breezy. Also, a plane in flight is constantly changing its angle of attack or even flying through clouds, this further diminishes its exposure to sunlight. So for this reason, a lot of models today have batteries attached to the panels to reserve some power for scenarios like this. 
So let's take a look at one such aircraft as a case study, Solar Impulse 2. It broke records in 2016 as the very first solar-powered aircraft to circumnavigate the globe. With a 72-meter wingspan that's wider than the 747, it only weighs 4,400 pounds, about the weight of an average car, and is capable of staying in the air for up to 36 hours with a crew of one. But most impressive of all is probably its breezy top speed of 70 kilometers an hour. And at the end of the day, the speed limit is the biggest factor in why solar planes won't be a practical replacement for jets anytime soon. Well, why can't we just make them fly a little faster? Well, there's a delicate balance game at play here because how fast a plane can fly is generally determined by three main factors. How heavy the plane is, how aerodynamic it is, and how much power is being generated. And there really isn't much wiggle room on any of these. For weights, these aircrafts are already incredibly light, designed using the bare minimum structures and very lightweight material. Any further optimizations could risk the structural integrity of the aircraft during flights. And aerodynamically, the Solar Impulse 2 is basically already at its peak glide ratio as well, since during landings, the pilots actually shut off the engines and fly the aircraft as a glider. And lastly, unfortunately, we can't just generate more power by placing more solar panels because that would require Require a larger wingspan, again affecting weight and also performance of the aircraft, the first two factors. And even if the existing panels operated at 100% efficiency, which is literally not possible, then the Solar Impulse 2 would still have a top speed of around 250 km an hour, not much faster than a Cessna. So to summarize, there are a lot of great things about solar aircrafts like the Solar Impulse 2. For example, it did a great job at raising awareness of sustainability in aviation. Specifically, solar aircraft can spend days in the air without refueling and traveling over an impressive range. They're quiet, essentially 100% clean with very low operating costs. But on the other hand, solar aircrafts can be very fragile and depend on the conditions of the day. They're too slow and have too little payload to be used for commercial flights. But this doesn't mean that all hope is lost because there are niches where they could potentially work. For example, there are great alternatives to aerial photography planes that need to fly low and slow to begin with. So what about making this power source a little bit more powerful? What if we replace them with batteries instead? Now, batteries are no stranger to our daily lives, so is it possible to build a mega-sized version to power our planes and essentially recharge them at airports, similar to the way we get home and charge our phones and our laptops? Well, the first issue is actually certification. Now, you may be glad to hear that it generally takes years for the FAA to certify any new aircraft, especially electric ones, making sure that every inch of them is safe. And because of this, some companies have gotten creative by retrofitting old existing planes to speed up that certification process. That is, replacing the old gas engines and fuel tanks with new electric batteries and motors. And for the most part, this seems like a great idea. For example, in Vancouver, an electric motor manufacturer called Magni X teamed up with a local airline called Harbor Air to fly a retrofitted electric Cessna back in 2019. Now this became the very first fully electric commercial flight. Now this 30 minute flight costs just $6 in comparison to the $400 it would cost with traditional fuel. But it's not time to celebrate yet, because while this may work for a six passenger flight between Vancouver and Seattle, it doesn't really scale much beyond that. And the biggest bottleneck here is weight, because the best lithium ion batteries today have a specific energy of around 300 watt hours per kilogram, while the specific energy of traditional jet fuel is around 12,000 watt hours per kilogram. What this means is that one kilogram of jet fuel can provide 40 times more energy than a battery can. And on top of that, the amount of jet fuel decreases throughout flights, making the traditional jet lighter and lighter as it flies. But batteries remain the same weight regardless of how much charge is left. And another minor point here is that it takes around an hour to recharge a two passenger electric plane, whereas a Cessna can be refueled within minutes. And scaled up to commercial operations, that might add a significant overhead as well. But there are a lot of positives for battery-powered plane as well. For one, electric motors are more efficient at converting energy into thrust than traditional combustion engines. I wasn't able to find an accurate comparison for airplanes, but for reference, the electric motors in cars have around 85% efficiency, whereas traditional gasoline engines have around 30% efficiency. Electric motors also have the edge over traditional jet engines.
engines in that they're lighter and have less moving parts. Now this means they're cheaper to manufacture and also require less maintenance. But in the end, while electric motors have a lot of advantages over traditional jet engines, they're just not enough to offset the additional cost to store that energy. Because to handle the additional weight of the batteries, you need to have a more powerful plane. But to add more power to the airplane, you need to add more batteries, and on and on and on. In a report on the impact of electric propulsion, Dr. Andreas Schaffer suggested that only on electric batteries, an Airbus A380 could only fly a range of around 1,000 kilometers, compared to its typical range of 15,000 kilometers. To maintain its current range, it would require batteries weighing 30 times its current fuel intake, meaning it would never get off the ground. So ultimately, the key to unlocking battery-powered flight is in increasing energy density. And in the same report, Dr. Schaffer estimated that in the past few years, battery energy density has increased about 3 to 4% every year. And if this trend continues, we'll have a commercially viable battery with a specific energy of around 800 watt hours per kilogram by roughly 2050. Now, this is a fascinating report written by some of the top scholars in the field of electric aviation. So I'll leave a link to the report down below if you want to take a look yourself. Now, I know all of these numbers and concepts sound extremely daunting, and that's exactly how I felt when I was researching this video. But a great resource that I used was Brilliance. It's an online platform for learning topics in math, science, and engineering. And before I filmed this video, I took their course on classical mechanics and realized just how much I had forgotten from university. But I found their content really engaging with examples of just how these theories apply in real life and interactive quizzes to make sure that I'm really absorbing the material. And if you want to learn more about the theory behind sustainable energy, they even have a course on solar energy, which I'm working through now. To learn more about Brilliance, go to brilliant.org forward slash Jenny Ma and you can try it out completely free. And if you like what you see, they're kindly offering a 20% discount off their annual plan for our viewers as well. So hopefully now you have a better understanding of electric planes and what their potential futures could be. Now, I know it can be a little demoralizing thinking about just how far away fully eco-friendly flight could be, but at least for me, I'm really optimistic about the progress that we've made so far. And I think it's a great thing that so many people in the industry are now focusing on sustainable energy and sustainable flights, as I am trying to do in making this video as well. I think planes like the Solar Impulse and the MagniX electric plane have really paved the way to shift the attention onto electric planes. So I'm really confident that it can only go up from here. Thank you guys for sticking with me to the end of this video. What are your thoughts on electric airplanes? Do you think they're a good idea? Do you think you would want to fly in one? Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, please remember to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. And as always, I'll see you guys next time.